Kia ora kato katoa. I um, was saying earlier, having some conversations with people, that it is a real pleasure to be at my second in-person conference um, for 2020. Um, obviously, I am a huge advocate for, for digital and everything bionic, but there is nothing actually like connecting in person um, and sharing stories, I think, to drive progress. Um, especially privileged, I guess, to be here um, at what I'd consider to be the, the centerpiece event for the ASM Con ASM's conference 2020, um, because there's, there's probably nothing more important to be talking about, um, in my view, certainly, other than equity, and equity in health, um, but equity in society more broadly. Um, before I, I introduce um, Jade, um, I, I wanted to take a, a moment to uh, square off some cognitive dissonance I've been experiencing. Um, because how do you set up or, or facilitate a conversation about equity? You could present data. Um, hopefully, most of us are aware about, um, I guess, the, the appalling data um, that speaks to our equity challenge here in New Zealand. Um, we could talk about different disease states. Um, but I went back to a place around sort of lived experience. And so if you'll indulge me for maybe two minutes or so, I want to take you back to when I, as a 16-year-old, arrived in New Zealand, um, sort of fresh off the plane, the first plane trip I'd ever been on. Um, and my family made the decision to move to Kirikiri. Um, so I was hugely excited and also terrified as a 16-year-old Cape Coloured um, landing in a new country, not knowing what to expect. Um, the excitement and, I guess, pride grew for me as I entered school um, and learned that I had the choice to learn about New Zealand history um, as opposed to European history. Um, and so as I learned about Te Tiriti, Kawanatanga, Tino Rangateratanga, Oriteratanga, my pride really grew, and I thought, wow, my new home country embraces its heritage. It embraces its indigenous people, and that's absolutely amazing and awesome. That excitement and that pride turned to confusion for me, though, as I started making friends and as I started venturing out a little bit further. Um, and when I went and visited some friends that lived in Kaikoe, as an example, I saw that Kaikoe had a McDonald's and Kirikiri didn't. Kaikoe had two general practices. Kirikiri had six. The houses of some of, some of my friends in Kaikoe looked very different to the houses a number of my friends in Kirikiri were living in. And that started to, I guess, remind me of actually some of the experiences I had in terms of growing up in apartheid South Africa. That paradox never left me. It followed me through to med school, it followed me through my early clinical career, and it's followed me through my career ever since. So literally, fast forward 22 years, and that paradox has not been squared away. That equity challenge for us as a health workforce, for us as New Zealanders, has probably actually gotten worse in a number of areas. That's not on anybody else's hands but our own. On my hands, on our hands here as a health workforce. And that's why I think this is the centerpiece event for this conference. Equity is where it's at, and we've got to move from rhetoric, talk, to actually dealing with these challenges. When I, um, Jade and I actually um, talked just briefly before, and we, we did meet at med school. Jade was probably two years ahead of me at med school. But when we, when we connected, um, reconnected on the phone last week, um, a Maori proverb actually came to mind after that conversation I had with Jade. That's, um, kaore te kumra e korero mo tona aka reki. And that's the kumra doesn't speak about its own sweetness. So the thing I was left struck with when, um, after that conversation with Jade was, here is somebody who has achieved so much and is yet so humble. And so it's my job today to do a little bit of bragging on Jade's behalf. Um, so Jade is an endocrinologist at um, Waikato District Health Board. Um, she's a senior lecturer for the University of Auckland and also coordinates programs for medical students, training the future leaders of our health system. Jane is, Jade is the equity lead at Waikato District Health Board as well. And she is an award-winning researcher and champion for equity. So the thing I'm really excited about again after my conversation with Jade 
and about today's presentation is that here is someone who has the ability to bring all of those different lenses to this equity challenge and to this equity opportunity and I guess sit down and lay out the challenge for us as we continue to engage. So from me, without further ado, over to you, Jade. Tēnā rākoutou katoa, ko te mea tua tahi me ngā mehi ki te maraikura, ko koe, jau, mā o kupu e tuwhiratea te hui nei. Kia pita hoki me o kupu tautohe o te ata nei. Ko te mea tua rua, ngā mehi ki ngā tawira i haramai i tēnei hui, ko koutou ngā... Ngā kai kaha o te ao hurihiri, tēnei te mihi ki ao koutou. Ka huri anō ki ngā kai mahi, kai ngā hoa kai mahi e mahi ana i te hohipera, tēnā rā koutou katoa. Ko wai au, ki te taha o toku mama, ko ngā te manjopoto te iwi, ko parongia te maunga, ko waipā te aua, ki te taha o toku papa, ko ngā te kahanunu te iwi, ko maunga haumi te maunga, ko waipaua te awa, ko jai tamatea tuku ingoa. So kia ora. Um, as I said in my introduction there, I do want to firstly acknowledge the words that Joe has started um, today's hui with um, around the challenge of getting us to consider what equity means in our day-to-day -day work. Um, I'd also like to echo and acknowledge the words that um, Professor Peter Crampton uh, made uh, around the importance of equity within every aspect of our healthcare service. Um, I'd like to welcome our students um, who I see as our future um, and who we should be at all times um, role modelling what good healthcare looks like. Um, but lastly, um, thank you to you all uh, for giving me this opportunity to share something that I find really, um, that I care really passionately about, and that's equity uh, in healthcare. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank Sarah Ma and the rest of the organising team um, for being brave enough and bold enough to give the microphone um, over to have this discussion, both with what Joe had to say um, and what I'm going to enforce you listen to for the next 40 minutes. Um, in my research, I think it's really important to define my position before I start, and I'm going to do that with my um, kōrero today as well. Um, firstly, I'm positioned here as a consultant endocrinologist who is not a member of the ASMS. So I think that gives me some insights, both as an insider, as a fellow clinician, but also as a little bit of an outsider of the organisation, and that gives me the ability to introduce some challenges to us all. Um, secondly, I get to bring in my hat as an academic, where I understand and focus on what our role in healthcare inequities are, and what our services and our system does to drive those inequities. Thirdly, I'd just like to point out that I'm wearing my hat from Te Rope Papa Uruta, the National Māori Pandemic Group, a group that came out at an, an only a week's notice when the pandemic started breaking out and reminded us the importance of a Ma strong Māori voice and Māori sovereignty in decision making and influence at times of crisis. Now the pandemic has not caused inequity, it hasn't started this, but what it has done is ripped off the plaster to ensure that we all have to have a really close look at what's going on. And so I just want to stand with that sovereign spot to say that it's really important that our voices are heard. But lastly, and probably most importantly, I stand here as a daughter um, of a Māori man and a Māori mum whose health they've had, we've had to navigate. But I also stand here as the mum of two beautiful Māori Tongan children who are flourishing and thriving in our society. And as part of that and my wider whānau, I know that we are strong, brave, excellent people um, who can do well in health. All I need is for you guys to come along with us on the journey and help us to see that. So Joe started our quarter all today about arguing very eloquently as to why we need processes like hers and that in Te Kupunga Haura Māori to ensure that we have equity in our number of medical students coming through. But even when we both, both schools achieve that, we can't do it alone. Equity is not something that is for Māori clinicians to fix. This problem comes from generations, it comes from systems, and it requires each and every one of us in our clinical space to do something about it. And so because of that, that's really how I framed this quarter. What can we all do as individuals, as clinicians, as part of a system 
to ensure that we're always working towards equity. Oh, sorry guys. There we go. Starting with a really basic thing, um, so any medical student um, lecture knows you've got to start with the definition of the condition. Um, so this is the definition I'm going to use around equity. I just want to start by stating at all points throughout this corridor I'm talking about ethnic inequity faced by Māori within the New Zealand Aotearoa healthcare system. That doesn't mean I don't acknowledge there are multiple forms of, e e oh, sorry, of inequity, um, but that's the one of which I bring expertise to discuss today. Now the most standard definition of inequity is not just about it being different or being disparate, but that actually the underlying principles as to why there is a difference is are unfair, unjust, and probably most importantly, avoidable. This is a thing that can change. And if we take that as our definition of inequity, we have to acknowledge that it's actually systems that drive this to occur. Policies make decisions around who has access and how, access, how our systems look. That also means we have to take a social justice stance on this, that this is not okay and it's not something we can accept. But I equally take the stance on equity that we're not aiming to make outcomes exactly the same. I could do that by pulling back the health of some groups. Not a great plan as a clinician, I wouldn't want to do that. I'd aim to be aspirational and say that I want a system that allows my whanau to thrive and have access to all of the care that they have the human rights for. So we've all seen this diagram. I think it's a nice quick snapshot of the difference between equity and equality and it helps to give us a quick um, frame as to why some people need different things in order to have the same outcome. I do, however, want to briefly critique it. It incorrectly assumes that everyone starts with a level field. It ignores the fact that we might be on a hill or some of us may even be standing in a deep pup, uh, pit hole. It also draws our focus to the inadequacy or a deficit frame around the short kid. As a short person myself, I have issue with this. <laughs> but very, very rarely do we just focus on who built the fence. Why is the fence that height? Why wasn't it made to the height of the shortest child? And more importantly, why is there a fence at all? And so that's the system effect and the system driver of, an, of inequity, and the one I really want us to focus on today. Just to clearly state that equitable healthcare is a human right, stated by the WHO, equitable healthcare for Indigenous people, stated by UNDRIP, and more importantly, by the founding document of this country, Te Tiriti o Waitangi, equitable care and access to that is a right. So why do we have inequity? Well, there's a lot of people who have dedicated their entire lives to pulling that apart, but this is one that I like to keep it nice and simple. I'm an endocrinologist, I like pathways. Um, and these three factors are kind of what I think seem to drive inequity, or what this group described, I should say. One being the population or the patient factors, the one we probably focus on the most. Sometimes we may take a step further and look at the health professional factors. And lastly, occasionally, we might consider maybe what the healthcare system itself is doing, but all of them are affecting inequity. In our Aotearoa setting, I'd like to challenge our thinking even a little bit more on that, that actually the patient factors are predominantly related to our social determinants of health or our social determinants of equity. That our pay, uh, health professional factors are around our competency and safety within cult cross-cultural situations and that our systems factors are, as Peter said it before, institutional racism that need to be called that and treated as such. And that all of those didn't happen by accident. They all sit within a social, political, historical milieu that is the society in which we live in. And if we don't consider all of those factors, then we continue to have narrow approaches to fixing this problem. I also call out to my colleague, Rhys Jones, who reminds us to think about the ways in which um, inequities are driven along an axis. So again, if we think about a healthcare issue, that might be our health status. And we might acknowledge that there's some biological processes that drove to these differential outcomes. And occasionally, as clinicians, we might even go back one layer back to the surface causes to look at our um, risk factors or behaviours within an individual that drove that. 
But I'm challenging us to go even further back than that, to consider what are those social structures and what give us so, that give us status, that allow us to make behavioural decisions. And even more importantly, how did that societal factor get derived? What are our basic causes? Colonisation, racism, legal structures, tetiriti, those base core things that drive all of this along. I'm going to give Kamara Jones very little credit by racing through the slide. I could do an entire talk just on her gardener's tale alone. But the one reason I wanted to bring it up, and I heard us talking about gardens this morning, Joe, um, is the idea that we, th we often start to think of the inequity as being about the flower. And Kamara gives a great story here about putting, planting the same flower seeds into different pots, into one pot where we've got beautiful soil, where we allow it to grow, we put it in the sunlight, we water it frequently, we check on it, we pull out the weeds when things are going bad, and another pot where it's dry and arid and we don't care for it. And then we seem to be surprised when one flower flourishes and the other doesn't. And I just think it's such a good allegory. So your homework tonight is go and read Kamara's paper on that. So do we have an equity in New Zealand? Well, kind of like Lloyd just said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'm kind of hoping that we all accept that we've got the data now to prove it. We've got well over 50 years of data of, around inequity. It's time to move past collecting data. But we know that we have inequity of the social determinants of health um, and that, there's, that hasn't changed over time. We know that we have inequity in access to healthcare as measured by the New Zealand Health Survey, whether that's access to primary care or access to prescriptions. This is a really busy graph, and again, I'm going to race through it, but Pharmax works showing that prescribing and picking up of prescriptions um, between Māori and non-Māori, where that line of zero, a ra relative rate, would mean that Māori and, and non-Māori sorry, were being prescribed at the same rates. You can see in almost every medication, other than basically pain relief, we're being prescribed less, and more importantly, that there's been very little change in any of those groups since 2006-07 through to 2012-13. And lastly, and potentially most importantly, we have an equity outcome. And I've put up there probably the most important outcome, although debatable, um, of life expectancy. And as we can see, life expectancy is proved nationally for all, but the gap between Māori and non-Māori has not particularly changed since the 80s. And from Karina and Michael's recent paper showing that the avoidable death, the ones that we as clinicians can make an impact on, is hugely different between these groups. What about others, what do others say about inequity? Well, I just want to make the point, the Ministry of Health in their recent um, Whakamaua publication has acknowledged that there are inequities of care for Māori and that those are impacted by colonisation, racism and discrimination and that this needs to be actioned. The Waitangi Tribunal, as um, Joe already alluded to today, has ruled in the first of many um, inquiries in Y2575 that the pub the primary healthcare service was not treaty compliant um, and that there have been real deficits, partly due to the fact that there's been little partnership with Māori, little accountability in the decision-making rights, and we haven't been included in the decisions. And the recent release of the Health and Disability Review has also pointed out that the healthcare system is currently failing Māori and needs significant changes if it's going to be better. And that those changes need to be based on the principles of tetiriti, in particular that of partnership. Just for you, David. I wouldn't dare talk about the review without putting at least a side of the alternate view, which again I encourage you to read on page 173 signed by all of the Māori Expert Advisory Group and four of the members of the review committee themselves that pointed out that the Māori Health um, Authority that is um, proposed, need, if we're truly going to be aspirational, needs to have more power. It needs to be part of the structure that makes the decisions about what gets funded, what gets monitored and what success looks like. And it also makes the point, which I will repeat many times, that, I, that we believe now is the time for that change. We are ready as Aotearoa. So well, this is what I get from medical students. They do their early years really well, totally tick, understand it, inequity, awesome. Now what do I do? I'm just one person, I can't cure poverty. So what can we do? Well, actually there's heaps we can do as individuals. 
One of the think frameworks that I want us to consider as we go through this, and I've heard little bits of this come through already, is around do we indigenize or do we decolonize? To indigenize, we take the aspects um, of te ao Māori, the things that um, make uh, a system uh, tika, make it around Māori views, and we add them. We might learn some te reo, we might do a karakia, um, we might, um, if we were really stretching out, build an entire kaupapa Māori healthcare system. Equally though, when we're indigenizing, we need to lean into the slightly more uncomfortable one of decolonizing, sorry, acknowledging the colonial structures in which we're in and challenging those as well. It's not as much fun as a waiata, but it's key to equity. So when I was trying to work out how do I convince the, my colleagues, that this is a waka that they want to jump on and join me on, I started thinking about what it is when we do in a day. Now, when my kids were a little bit littler, I hope they've become a little more enlightened. They used to tell their friends that their parents were doctors. That's always exciting. Mum goes to hospital as a medical registrar at the time and saves lives. My husband, as a psychiatrist, no offence, guys, um, goes and does emails and drinks coffee. <laughs> Now, that is no insult, Mark, I promise. Um, but I think it just highlights the really narrow scope the public have of what we do in a day. This was last week's calendar, and I suspect that many of you have a calendar that looks very similar, with multiple conflicting um, and really diverse activities over our week. And there's a lot of things that go into being a doctor today. And I want to look at the way we can indigenize and decolonize each of those spaces that we go into over a week. Now, I'm a medical physician. My day usually starts with a ward round. We head out to see all the patients. And this is the, one of those points we really get hit in that clinical interaction around the issues with clinical co competence and cultural safety. Um, people have written, again, a lot on this, and I'm going to keep it really short. Um, but two kind of aspects here. Clinical competence, I see to be a little bit more like indigenizing. It's a little bit about what um, putting a foot, the lens onto the patient, what's interesting about them, what's their culture, having a really um, important frame about understanding their world. Cultural safety is a little bit more about decolonizing. It's turning that lens around back onto ourselves and actually putting, asking the question is, what is it about our culture? What is it about the culture in which we work in? How is that affecting this clinical interaction and the clinical decisions that I make? And I encourage you to read this recent paper by Elena et al. Um, we're really trying to unpick the literature around the difference between these and arguing, I think, really well that cultural safety is the step that we need now if we're truly going to be aiming for health equity. That doesn't mean you, can't, you can be clinically incompetent, it's just meaning that this is the next step in the process, or a step further. In that, it's important that we've got frameworks in which to interact with our Māori patients. And our students now at both med schools come through being taught about our HUI process put together by our colleagues and the Mihi um, Institute. Um, and this is a great framework to build around the um, Cal Calgary Cambridge, I never knew it was called that until these guys did this paper, um, framework of how to take a history from a um, patient. But allowing a te ao Māori structure to inform the way and to make the rules about how we interact with patients. Now I frequently get told by students and colleagues that the issue with this is that it would be great if we just had the time. Well, I refute that in a couple of ways. One, when you get good at it, it's actually pretty quick. Um, but secondly, it's actually just taking a history. It's just taking a really good culturally competent history, and that culturally safe, caught myself out there, culturally safe history, and ensures that the appropriate decisions are made, which actually saves time in the long run. But we've also got to turn the lens on ourselves and think about what we're doing. How is our pronunciation of, very, of complex Māori names? Do we understand the treaty and what it means for our job based on the fact that we have a contract with the Crown entity? Do we know that all of the organisations that make decisions around healthcare in this country have acknowledged that there is racism in our system? And do we know that we can actually study these and get more knowledge in this area as well? I frequently hear this term. And I have to be honest, it actually really worries me. Because if I start treating um, 
the four-year-olds in the same way that I treat my 94-year-olds is going to be a problem. We all treat our patients differently. We have to. They come with a different problem. They come with a different situation. But the problem is that this allows us a framework to think that we're treating our patients equitably. We all have heard different frames of why patients aren't getting the outcomes that we need. We have that focus strong on the deficits in what they do. But actually, there's evidence that we do things differently too. And this is some lots of different evidence around general practice and the, and the deficit in care that Māori patients get compared to non-Māori. This isn't an attack on general practice, particularly because they're not here and that would be unfair, but actually, we know that this is going to be the case no matter where we're looking. So the fact is, actually, that's not true. We don't treat our patients all the same, and we actually treat them quite inequitably if we're not focused on doing it differently. Implicit bias, again, has been brought up today, and it's really important that we acknowledge its existence and that we, most importantly, start to acknowledge our own implicit biases and how they impact our, our decision-making. We know we make cognitive shortcuts. It's actually part of what we're trained as clinicians to do. But actually, when they're about the person and they're not taking into consideration their lived experience, they can become harmful, and that's the problem. And we know that the situations that we find ourselves in every day when we're multitasking, we've been overworked, there's four people left to see an ED, those are the times we revert to these shortcuts even more. And if we don't acknowledge that, we won't avoid them. So after my ward round, I'd whip off to clinic. And at this point, I want us to focus on the social determinants of health and how they impact on our interactions with patients and what we can do about them. We know that the social determinants um, are a huge impact on the outcomes of health. But I do want to pause for a moment to acknowledge that these didn't happen by accident. And that is why they are the social determinants of equity as well. Again, what I often hear from students in this discussion is that, but that's outside of healthcare. I can't fix that. Well, in some ways that's true, but come along with me for a protest and we'll have our best. But even within our healthcare space, there's things that we can do. We can design our healthcare system so that it actually doesn't matter what your social determinants are, you get the care you need. We can think about the way we individually deliver that care. Or we can link into other health services. We live work in such isolated silos that make it much harder for those that have social um, con constraints to make it through the system. But we can also start to learn to work with external services. When was the last time you picked up the phone and rang WINS to advocate for one of your patients? When was the last time you did a letter for Housing New Zealand? And more importantly, we can advocate. We've been lucky enough to be given a voice that gets heard above those of others, and we can use that voice to advocate for the importance of doing something about poverty in this country. So I advocate that this is, to asking this information around this has to be more than just a social history. It can't just be for the notes. It has to be something we do something about each time we gain that information. And we should know what the services are in our community. Our whānau order providers do amazing work on far less income than we have. Our Māori health providers similarly, and we should know what iwi are in our region and who we can lean on to ensure that we get good quality services. And we should think about co-design, but acknowledge that co-design means the co-part. Well, not only do we bring community in and expect them to fix our problems, we actually have to turn up with the money and the power to allow those solutions to occur. I like this quote from the previous Director General of Health, when we had a president that believed in science. Um, Tom Fryden said that your longevity and health are more determined by your zip code than they are by your genetic code. Like many of you, one of our key roles is teaching. And as been mentioned today already, health and medicine is an apprenticeship model. And so I want to remind you that it's important that your key role models on what equity looks like in healthcare to our students. We know there's formal ways that we can assess our students as we go through, but most of their education comes from that apprenticeship time on the wards. And that hidden curriculum that they learn along the way can be both really powerful and, and inspiring, 
or detrimental, and we play a role in that as clinicians on the ward. I'm going to steal your photo again there, Joe. But as Joe already said, this was our landmark um, graduation of Māori trainees. These guys are now on your wards, hoping to be trained. But yet, we can, despite all the evidence of what they're doing to our healthcare system, they still have to hit up against public scrutiny about whether they are worthy enough to be entered into this program. And so we have a role in that as well. We can break that discourse. We can become part of the fight. We did, as the college, write a letter to say that absolutely we need these guys here because it matters for us and our clinical work as well. Because this is the reality as physicians. So while the population is 15% and our med schools are winning at 13%, I was the eighth after those seven physicians that were Māori in, this, in our college. And I can't train all of the guys coming through. I need you guys to be playing the role in physician and training our um, trainees as well. So we need to acknowledge that our trainees need to be moved on past PGY1 and PGY2, and that our colleges need to actually be active and more importantly proactive about the way they train and, and recruit and look after and take care of our precious taonga. And that that needs to be explicit. It can no longer be, we'll just sit here with our processes and hope that some of our Māori students will come through. We need to be hunting them down so they don't all go to public health. <laughs> Um, we need to make sure that they're well looked after. And if we can't do that, we need to give them access to who can. So the te ora hui, our Māori, I mean, our Māori health um, committees throughout the colleges, through PRIDOC, we need to ensure that they've got the networking and safety wrapped around them and that they aren't, aren't burdened with the finances to complete. And some of the colleges are starting to work on this, and this is really exciting, and I really like being involved in this process. But I think what's key is that we acknowledge that the way the universities did it was to be unapologetically brave and state what they were going to do and then back that up, and the colleges need to do the same. Joe's already mentioned this, but I really want to take a, make us all take the moment to acknowledge cultural loading. And that is what's added on to the day of a Māori trainee, student or clinician. And the uh, Medical Council has just released this piece of uh, document looking at equity and acknowledging the extra work that our Māori trainees have to do. And that importance of that is really comes down to the rest of us. What extra expectations are we have putting on our trainee? Are we asking them to translate something because their reo is sufficient? Are we asking them to run te reo hui um, within our, within our um, departments without any extra acknowledgement of that as training or pay or um, CPD? Or are we being great allies and acknowledging that actually we can grow our trainees to be more and that we need to be part of that as well? Lastly, we'd all rock off to a journal club. But what are we reviewing in our journals? What is our own, um, our own professional development looking like? I've heard already people talk about going on a journey with te reo, which is awesome. And the opportunities for that are infinite throughout the Aotearoa. But we can also do work looking at tetiriti and the impact it has on our day, or how we can decolonize um, with courses all over the place, including online. We can do audits of our work, of our department, of our institutions to actually look at what equitable, equity looks like in our team. And we can make sure that our cultural competency and hopefully soon cultural safety training is up to date, just like our CPR is. And we can go out and have, start to have courageous conversations, change our echo chamber, understand some of the really interesting discourse that's been done out there around decolonizing and be becoming an anti-racist space. Because in my opinion, there actually are professional development skills that we should all be working towards with regards to equity. And that includes good quality research that isn't just pulling in one of our Māori students, but actually focuses on the key points that Paparangi and friends wrote about with regards to what good quality research for equity would look like in this country. Lastly, and probably most importantly, is our governance roles and the leadership that again has been discussed a lot today. And this is where we can start to influence the really big elephant in the room, the institutional racism. 
We know that the way in which we develop systems can, can systematically include or exclude certain people, and we need to have Māori in the room at those times that these decisions are being made to critique that at the time, not 10 years later when we have the data that there was an inequity. And we should be looking at international evidence through the lens of our Aotearoa experience and what we know about access issues and what we know about the way in which we deliver health care. And we need to be explicit about pro-equity approaches within the governance roles that we have. And we need to challenge all layers of racism, as, de as described by Kamara, in that space. So Taika was brave enough to say a few years ago that New Zealand was racist, and he got a lot of fl flack for it. But just this week, two key pieces have come out, which again draw to mind the fact that there is racism in the way decisions are made within Aotearoa. And for some, this is um, Te Aniwa Hurunui. Racism is explicit. And this is just snippets of an email she received just this week after producing information around equity. So if you're, part of, if you're lucky enough to be in a leadership role and be part of governance structures, have a look at the structure. What does the board look like? What does partnership look like there? What do your policies say about actually achieving equity? Do you have a clear commitment to tertiary? Are you responsive and, more importantly, accountable to the communities in which you serve? So when I was asked to do this, there was, we were, I became aware of the journey that ASMS is making. And so I have some last sort of one-line questions that I think are really key to consider when outside organisations and health are starting to think about what their journey towards being um, pro-equity advocates could be. The first question is, where is that Tiriti partnership? Who are you sharing the mic with to, um, and how, whose voice are you allowing to be heard? Whereabouts is your comments and statements about equity and tertiary? Are they in your constitution as a fundamental feature of every decision you make, or are they in a sideline policy around Māori health? And more importantly, then, how do you operationalise that once it's stated clearly in your framework? What do you measure? How do you report that? And how do you decide when you are achieving or doing enough? What do you know about your membership? How many Māori AMS, ASMS members are there? What are their needs? What has their journey been like? What's the narrative of the journey of becoming a consultant SMO in this country as Māori? And lastly, use your privilege. You've been given the privilege of a really strong membership. You've been given the privilege of a voice that has the ability to do advocacy. So use your privilege wisely. You have the privilege of having the funds to do high quality research. Use that privilege wisely. Because ultimately, equity has to be all of our responsibility. There's no other way that we're actually going to be able to get there. And so these are the key aspects that I want you to take into your day-to-day -day work in the months and weeks, that years that come. Um, and remembering that it's great to indigenise, um, don't get me wrong, I love it, but make sure you're doing some of the hard work to decolonise the space that you're in as well. Because some journeys look like this, and that's awesome, but for some of us, this is the road that we would take to get from one point to another. So leaving you with the words of Rhys Jones again, that it's time now to have a free, frank and fearless discussion in which there is zero tolerance for white fragility and racism, and in which there is an understanding that Māori and Pacific leaders' knowledge and expertise will be privileged rather than undermined. Because as we all rush, rush back to business as usual past COVID, we really do have to run, wonder about whether some of that business is acceptable. Nō reira, e tūmutinga, tēnā mahi ki a koutou katoa i a tangata, tēnā koe. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you know the wire, please.
between your singing voice uh, and the harmony of us all. Um, so it's Te Aroha, Te Whakapuro, Te Rangi Mane, Ka Tau Ka So it's, it's a simple song uh, which really talks about uh, love, uh, faith, uh, peace for all of us. Uh, and so this is the way that we like to sing it to So a three-letter word does come to mind, wow. Um, I actually, I'm actually going to get you standing up again, and, and let's just give Jay a huge round of applause for that. Um, so we do, we do have some tech to help us, um, I guess, facilitate discussion around, around um, this, this next part of the korero. Um, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to perhaps do a double act with Sarah around getting, getting questions up. But um, nothing like an in-person event to ask some, some actual questions. And I see there are some microphones out on the floor. I've, I've got a few questions and I guess comments that, that could get us started. However, this is about the, the ASM's voice, I think, as, as Jade has correctly pointed out. So we'll open it up to the floor for any initial questions. Um, and if we can keep perhaps questions to, to one question at a time, um, that'll be fantastic. Okay, so I've got three that have come through Slido, and yeah, there are those two microphones if people want to do it themselves. But also I would invite you, Lloyd, one of the reasons we've asked you to facilitate and chair this session is because of the knowledge and experience you bring and also your role as part of the Health and Disability Review Panel and the position you took, particularly around the Māori Health Authority. Mm -hmm. um, page 173. So if you want to kick off, that is your privilege. We give that to you today, if you'd like. But I've got just the three here at the moment. You've all gone shy. Um, I think perhaps let's take, take one. Okay, yeah. Okay. And then I, I, I'm happy to talk. So Tim um, Ritchie has said, Kia ora Jade, inspirational. Thank you. Have you got any practical solutions that allow us as clinicians to identify who of our patients are Māori? Yes, ask them. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, sorry, I jest. Um, but I don't. It was, uh, the only way, so ethnicity is a social construct, it's self-defined, and as you can see, some of us are fairer than others, um, and that does not change our identity. Um, and the only way to really know for sure is to ask a patient. Now, how you do that depends on um, your own style um, and the way in which you build a relationship with a patient. But as part of the MIHI process, which I mentioned um, before, um, the sorry, hui process. Um, the one of the first key steps is identifying the ethnicity of the patient and understanding through whakafanaungatanga what their um, roots and identity is. Um, so I, yeah, I think the the key thing is trying to understand. The best way to understand anything about a patient is to ask them in their own words. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions from the floor, perhaps? I know we've got another two here. Three, three up on the floor. Oh, oh, they're starting to fly in. Okay, shall I? So, um, this one I think speaks to the way we uffy each other or not um, in our journeys. So, Marlise asks, as an IMG, I would love some actual practical advice on cultural competence telling me that mispronouncing names is rude and colonisation is terrible, which it is, 
uh, does not help much when I am trying to connect with patients? It's a really useful question. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and I think that the, the key thing is that we're all learning at different stages um, uh, along that journey. Um, but I think uh, it's around acknowledging that cultural competency and cultural safety are, if, you know, if we're considering them key competencies, then they need the time put into them. Um, and um, I would actually argue the system needs to recognise them as key competencies and, and it have um, systems in place. But to answer specifically around your question, you know, with regards to pronunciation, it is so important to get people's names right. Seattle Moxon's done some great work in that space, and if it is a, um, if it's identified as something that's a learning need for you, then there are great tools, both online and in person, um, to work through um, developing strategies to get pronunciation right. Um, like all things we do, it doesn't just happen one day. We have to go and, and seek out the right information and put the time in and do the training um, in order to do that. And so cultural competency, cultural safety, pronunciation, um, interacting with Māori patients is just the same. And I hope that in that presentation I've given some tools um, that you could use um, for that. Working. Oh, there we go. Actually, the, the issue is that we get these cultural competency sessions and it just turns out into saying, oh, you need to pronounce these people's names right. I don't think that's enough. I don't feel that's enough. The cultural competency online course that I did was telling me that Maori are uh, disadvantaged. I know that. I want to know what to do. I want to know how to talk to people, how to approach people. Hmm. What is their world view? What's important? Which questions should I not ask? Which questions should I ask in a different way? Um, the, what, what topics are taboo when you meet someone for the first time? That's the kind of stuff that we're not getting. We all know that barrier disadvantage. We know that colonization is horrible. We know that there's institutionalized racism, but that doesn't help. That's not enough. We need, we need actual courses. Because enough, I've done more than one course, and it's frustrating, because it's just reading a lot of things about how things are not right, but mm. nothing actually saying how I can make things better. Mm. That's right. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'd go back to, yeah, if you can identify what the learning need are, is, and you've mentioned a few there that you've identified, um, there are multiple um, resources, um, some of which were in the presentation, that would really help with understanding some of the questions um, that you raised, whether that be around pronunciation, whether that be around the approach to a Māori patient. Um, but I would back that up also by saying that's part of the reason why we want to push for cultural safety, that we're taking it above and beyond that, actually, to understand um, and ask more questions about ourselves as part of that journey and as part of the reflection as well. So we've got another question over the end. Before we come to that, can I just sort of add to, mm -hmm. to what Jada said there? Um, a lot of this is about and, and. Um, so whilst, like you say, those, those initial steps are important but probably not enough, um, we shouldn't discount the importance of them in the first place. That's the first point. Second point is, I think, as, as Jade has outlined, I love that indigenize and decolonize because it's again about an and, and. Um, and I can hear yeah, your, your accent is, is similar to mine. Um, so if, if, if you think about some of the steps you might have taken, you know, back, back in South Africa in terms of engaging, some of this is actually on us. It's not about content being brought to us. It's about us actually going forward. Being, pre be, being prepared to make mistakes and to be vulnerable and to be called out when we make those mistakes. And then as, as I think Jade has outlined, reflect on how that implicit bias and, and those implicit attitudes actually need to change from our own perspective. And that's the, that's the power of the, the decolonize approach. But I think these are mutually, um, mutually dependent on each other actually. It's not mutually exclusive. It is about an end end to take it forward. I had a question over here. Yeah. 
Yeah. There, there are so many resources out there, and I would hate to put any one institution over another, but there's, there are, if you go looking for them, they are there. That's great. So, so do you, well, you're welcome to pick for yourself, if you like, but there's some, there's some fantastic questions that we need to pick up. Um, there is one person who's asked me to, to do a ground round at HDHB <laughs> weekly. That might take a little while. <laughs> do have a more than a full-time job. Um, and I just wanted to um, acknowledge Anu's comment around um, the students have taken um, it upon themselves, which I love, uh, the University of Otago to approach the clinical skills leader tu leaders tutors um, about starting the conversation about integrating the HUI process really early on in the early years. And I just wanted to acknowledge that also because we've had the same conversations uh, at the University of Auckland around, um, we're kind of, st I'm sick of teaching it as an add-on later, they've got to be integrated as part of the same thing because they are, it's just taking a history, it's talking to a patient, it's clinical skills. Um, yeah, okay. I was uh, struggling. Yeah. Kia ora, David. <laughs> uh, so the question is, do other DHPs have an equity lead? It sounds like a huge job. What does it entail? Uh, so it's a very new position that's come out of our um, local response to um, COVID. Uh, it's... Um, it's actually a clinical equity lead, um, and so the point is taking clinical um, leadership um, and governance um, and uh, using in, uh, to advocate for equity. Um, so I share that lead with my colleague, Dr. Myra Roka, who's a haematologist, um, and we are a whole four months into the position, so KPIs are still being established. Um, but actually, one of the key things it does, and I hope Ruth would agree here, is actually allowing a... Um, a group of clinicians with expertise in equity to be part of the conversations um, when new processes are being rolled out and trying to have um, strategic discussions at the higher level, um, bringing those two different strands together. Oh, this is fun. Um, so how do you deal on an individual basis with a family who have ingrained mistrust in authority structures? Kia ora, Siobhan. Um, okay, so I'm going to start that really quickly by saying every patient in whānau is different and I don't have one approach um, specifically to anything. Um, however, uh, so firstly um, acknowledging that a large number of our whānau do have um, a distrust in authority and a distrust in health. And I think first we have to acknowledge why that exists, um, that that also didn't happen in a vacuum um, and that people bring with them to your clinical interaction um, their previous experiences. Um, and so we have to acknowledge those and as a member of that healthcare system, we have to um, accept um, our responsibility for them, even if they weren't ours personally. Um, I do chronic um, healthcare. Um, I take care of conditions that last for months, if not years. Um, so I see that as a, a, as a process. I'm not going to fix 20 years of um, poor interactions with um, authority in my first one hour new patient set slot. Um, but I'm going to ensure that I'm going on a journey with the patient and build a safe space that both them, their whānau um, and I can work out what that's going to look like, um, negotiating along the way. Um, so that, yeah, again, not an expert, not one way of doing it, but that's generally my approach. Three minutes. Oh. Can we can we take three mi minutes? And I guess the the challenge Jade has thrown out for for the audience and and for Asms is is really that question about yes, at an individual level, what what can we each do in terms of driving the equity agenda forward? But I'm very interested in in some comments and discussion around what Asms as an advocacy advocacy organisation could do um, in this space as well. Because I guess one of the reasons we we reached out to Sarah as um, four members of the, of the panel that um, uh, helped to author the alternative view was ASMS does have a powerful voice. Um, and our ask to ASMS was actually to take a position specifically on the MHA and come out with that position. So I guess, you know, alongside that challenge with Jade, I'm, I'm interested to put that challenge out to the, to the membership and to the association. Perhaps in the last minute, get some commentary around that. I second that. <laughs> I would really like you guys to tell us what you think about that. Yeah. Jane, do you want to grab a mic? Or come up here, Jane. Yeah. <laughs> or you can come, come up here, Jane. Here. Jane? Um, 
Um, so I'm Jane Thomas. I'm a, um, an anaesthetist and a pain medicine specialist at Starship. And in fact, I want to congratulate Sarah and all the speakers today. Um, what you've talked about is a very difficult topic. And uh, I have had a lot to do with Sarah over the last two years in almost taking a personal grievance against ADHD for racial and gender bias. And um, so it's a, a topic that's very dear to my heart and it's pretty much almost impossible to actually get anywhere. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone in the room for listening because the only way to change this is for Pākehā and uh, other ethnicities um, to actually say we need equity for everyone, Māori, Pacific, uh, um, you know, women, uh, people of Indian, Asian origin, we're a really multi multicultural society and so I think it actually goes beyond Māori and Pacifica now. Um, there are, I know we're indigenous people but I think we are such a multicultural society mm -hmm. and um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for listening in this room and I hope you really take this home and try and advocate for some changes within your DHB. Thank you. Kia ora, so, so I think we, we, we perhaps do need to wrap up and move on to the next, next um, session. Um, that, that is a challenge that, um, believe me, we'll be coming back to Sarah through Sarah to the membership um, to, to come and ask about. Um, our, our, our hope is that, that ASIMS does use its voice. Um, this is, yeah, you know, we, we've, we've, we've heard all the talk um, that the time really is now. Um, there is a groundswell around this issue and this opportunity for, for Aotearoa, and, and we've got to take it. Um, so again, huge thanks to Jade. Um, what a magnificent presentation. And I think, you know, if we ever needed more motivation and, and the challenge to, to get going, We've certainly got it here today. Thank you very much for the opportunity.